This is another edition of Live Your Dreams, an inspirational program on Star Television Network that inspires you to live your life, follow your dreams, and not give up. I always say success is not cheap. It comes in very expensive. All the successful people you know, ask them. They'll tell you there's a story to it. Everyone went through a struggle to be successful. Don't just look at someone and want to be the person and not want to go through struggles as well. It doesn't work like that. In today's edition of the program, as usual, I'm your presenter, Fabian Swill, and our guest today, we're going to be talking to Honorable Alaji Dr. Alpha Khan. Well, most times people call him Alpha Khan. And he's the one we're going to hear his story today. He's a successful man right now, but how did he come to be successful? He's right here with us, and he's going to tell us his story. Thank you very much for joining us in the program today. Let's start with your background. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Thank you very much. My name is Alfred Kano, as you said. I was born in Lokomasama, a village called uh, Pitful uh, Babara. It's a very beautiful village by <laughs> the uh, uh, Little Scarces River. And I grew up on the riverside. And, uh, but at a very early age, my grandfather came and took me, in less than three years, took me to live with him in Potloko, because my family is originally from Potloko. They had gone to uh, uh, Lokomasama, being the breadbasket of the country. My father, being a uh, uh, farmer, uh, had chosen Lokomasama as a place to go to work uh, uh, seasonally. And my father was the one who had to stay back and uh, tend the farms and look after the area. How? So I was born uh, there, but I would grew up for about age three in Potloko, that's over 60 years ago. How many siblings do you have? I was born six in number. We lost a sister, one, so one uh, place removed from me, older, who died when I was very young. And then we were five uh, sisters from the same father, because you know you have uh, spoligam families. And then uh, we had, uh, uh, when my father died, uh, my mother remarried and had another son. So together I had six uh, siblings. But um, three of them are now deceased. Uh, there's only three of us. Uh, How would you best rate the family you grew up in, your family, in terms of wealth? Uh, well, wealth was success in up country was not measured by wealth you had. It's by your ability to maintain your family, the ability to... Uh, so if you say uh, on that basis, my grandfather was one who had a lot of uh, uh, children who were not his. Uh, he was a, a Quranic uh, uh, malam, you would say. He's a, uh, an imam, and uh, lots of people came, sent their children to him to uh, uh, teach them the Arabic and the Quran. So, you were able to maintain those, and you were able to uh, tend your farms when the time comes and all that. I'd say that when uh, you were there, we were, we were an did you go family. to the farm? Oh yes, of course, we went there. Not where, but age three, of course. But when I came to Potloko and I stayed with my grandfather, he also had a garden, I call it a garden, it's actually a, a, farm, a fruit farm, about one mile away from Potloko, at a place called Nagbin. When you're going to Lunge from Potloko, it is the first village you come. In fact, it's the only place where there's a bridge with water that <laughs> flows along that road. So as a first village, it's easy to identify. And that's where we go in the evenings after school. Uh, Which school did you attend? I went to Your a school, school called the Sierra Leone Church School. But before then, it was called the Church of England. And uh, it's, in fact, the first, very first birthplace of the Sierra Leone Gam School before <laughs> it... Uh, was removed to Freetown. It was one of the oldest schools in the country. So when that's where you did your primary school? That's where I did my primary school. Yes, what there. kind of a pupil were you back then when you were going to school? Well, I think my teachers should attest to that. Well, I think I was quite a, a good pupil. Mm -hmm. I, don't know. I was never second in my life. Uh, I'll guess that you're a brilliant pupil. Well, I said I was never second. Were you second. troublesome? Oh, well, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> well, I, mean, I liked uh, playing truancy because um, we had lots of bushes around with. Uh, uh, fruits, uh, wild fruit growing, malombo and mangoes and things like that. So anytime you have a small break, you wander off into the bush, into the forest to pick this 
for lunch, for breakfast. So we fed ourselves mostly from nature. And uh, we liked going to the river, which was run, the Kamaranka River, run just close to the school. And uh, when we have a, a, a free period, we would go and uh, have a dip in the river and come back. So that's the kind of truants we played. But we did enjoy school. We loved the singing, we loved the rhymes, we loved the health mental, and of course the spelling checks and things like that with the teachers. We were had fun with teachers. So when you were living with your granddad in Potloko, were you living with other relatives as well? Of course, I just told you that my grandfather reared a lot of children. Some of them he, some of them relatives, children, some of them just pure strangers who Parents had brought so them. what was what was life like living with other relatives? They're all brothers and sisters. They're all brothers and sisters. That is why we have a very very wide and extended family with a country. As I said some time ago, that is the basis of our own social security. Uh, unlike the uh, British system, where uh, when you are indigent and you can't afford uh, the basic necessities in life, you go to the system. We don't have a system. We have the support from the families. We have the support from the extended family. So that is a basis that gave us a standing in life. For example, I, uh, I became orphaned for a lack of a father from a very early age. At the age, uh, I think, eight, in 1960, when my father died here in Fritz. And uh, my grandfather and all the uncles came together to bring me up. So Did that losing your dad is. affect you in any way when you were growing up? Uh, no, not psychologically and not in terms of lacking things because we, when he was living, he did not live with us. He was a, a diamond uh, dealer in Kono. So oh, we, he, he, only came, he only came occasionally and even my mother and uh, my stepmother were all living with him at a place called Sedu. Were your parents the, educated? No. Well, yes, in the Quran. In the Quranic, they were. My mother was not. My father was a Quranic teacher himself, but a trader also, and of course, like I said, he's a diamond dealer. Education at that time, uh, in those days, was basically uh, education in the Quranic uh, education, in the Arabic. At what age did you start going to school? So I think I went to school about age six, between six and seven. Because at the time, uh, we were the second generation of the family who actually went to formal uh, Western education school. We had uncles, my uncle, the famous one, who was one of the first uh, who went to Dr. Shaki Khan, who became uh, Minister of Finance and yeah, Minister of Foreign Affairs. And then we had an uncle. Everybody else in that line went to school, except my father. But he was the first. Mm -hmm. And because he was the first, I was a very strong man, very costly. And uh, the father thought he was strong enough for him to go and they work on the farms and that they can support the other children in school and that's what they did. So, but when their turn came to educate us after our father died, so they did not shy away from that. They did all they could to make sure that we had the best education that was available. At what time. point in your life did you leave Port Local? When I came to secondary school here in Freetown, I came to Freetown in 1965. <laughs> the first time I came to Freetown was 1964 for a day trip. Can you imagine, we had lunches that uh, would fly from Port Loco to Freedom. And how old were you then? Uh, 1965, well look, I was born in 1952, so I was about 12, 13, I'm going to 13. So, when so I you came took to a whole 12 to 13 years to get to see the capital city in the country you No, were 12 born. to get to ca see the capital, 1964, and 13 to come to secondary school. <laughs> <laughs> I came to just today. Uh, we came at Sopit. We walked across uh, uh, Ekowa Street with? then by my grandfather. My grandfather was my friend. Did you wander off? No. You know, like a he was holding like me. He wouldn't let me. No, no, he wouldn't let go of me. We walked. But did you have that urge to just want to walk around? And, and, and get lost in Freetown? <laughs> I have been told that yeah, going to the city in Freetown, you could get lost easily because there are so many streets and so many so cars. So there was some amount of fear as well. Well, <laughs> trepidation and, and concern and also cautiousness so that I would go back to Port in the evening. We came by lunch in the morning, we walked up the street, uh, up uh, Sackville Street, went all the way to Rockland Street to see my uncle, Shaka Khan. We spent the day after lunch, we went back and then traveled back to Port Loco and got there in the evening. That was how. So when you relocated well to, to Freetown to further your studies, right? Yes. Who were you living with? Uh, same uncle, Shaka. Oh. 
so you left your grandpa now to live with your uncle. Uncle Sheikh, so what was, was my father's younger brother? What was the house like? What was the ho what was the kind it's of? It's still there. The house is still there at Wilkinson Road. Uh, was it like street. a populated number three Rockland Street? No, it's a two-story building. At the bottom, we had our neighbors with the Badamasis. You know, Aisha Badamasi, who is at the uh, uh, APC headquarters office. I live. We lived with her parents. In fact, when she was born when I was there. And I, I know I just to call my younger sister, practically born in my house. So how hands. many kids did your uncle have back then? At the time, well, I was his eldest. He hadn't had children yet. Uh, his so were you the only child in the no, house? No, 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 I was not. There were brothers from, uh, cousins and other from there, but I was like the child at the time because of you know, the, the And age-wise, were you like the youngest? Yes, I was. Were you house. being bullied? Uh, I don't need to go and fetch water. Yeah, you know, and then uh, wash the. So how would you respond to the bully? Uh, with a uh, little bit of uh, <laughs> difficulty, really, because if you responded physically, they would deal with you. But uh, I would hold it my head. Your up facial expression when yes. you were saying that—it's mm. like something came to mind. Can you share a story with us of how you were being bullied one day and how you responded to it? Uh, bully, really? I wouldn't call it bullying. We'd just say that it is the service of a younger brother to the elders in the house. They would send you to go get fetch water. But there was a time when I was doing some homework from school, French homework. And I was busy trying to show off my French uh, to the public. And I went to school and they'd given us this book called Nouveau Cours de Francais. My teacher then was Mrs. Alice Kamar, who was at the radio station there, SLBC. She was my French teacher. And she'd given us some homework uh, to learn how to read some passages. But I had thought that the uh, pronunciation in French it was the same as you would do when you have to pronounce all the syllables. And one thing I said uh, there, and I still remember, is that I was reading a sentence that says, Donnez-moi, donnez-moi le tableau noir. That is, give me the blackboard. Mm. So when I saw Donnez, spelled D O N N E Z, I said, Donnez-moi. <laughs> <laughs> donnez-moi le, le tableau noir. Mm. So uh, my elder in the house, I was reading some ugly French there, so come and go get water for me. And I, uh, look, I'm busy with my homework. And then he said, if you don't go, I'll take that book from you. I felt bad about it because I wanted to really show off my French, you know, at the time. So what was, did you do? I had to go. All right. Um, he is um, Honorable Alhaji Dr. Alpha Kanu, and he's our guest here in today's edition of Leave Your Dreams. He's telling us his story. Now we've heard about his upcoming year and um, we're going to go for a break now and when we come back we're going to hear the rest of his story and he's going to be inspiring us more and more it's leave your dreams stay with Sister. Na 
Na pimelie ela mai C'est bien Tobi mi a son pelingai Ma sangana ko Ma kamwezali minene Na peki simoni ngana ngai Abunda Ni kambo ba weli ya tikeo Amina Tikea kisasa briseleo Ni kambwezo kisi Mobali abato Tike bimisi sekele Makambo esali Minene Mikambo toswa ni ngana Zenaba Franco Ngai na zalima Maya likelemba Malindi mine abo iko Pesa likelemba Atombo kinangaye it's live your dreams here on star television network and that yes song from back in them days old old tune but we played that in case you're wondering it's because it's one of the favorite songs of our guest in this program, this edition. Now, um, Dr. Kanu, that song is from way back in the day. Give you the opportunity to just go down memory lane and, you know, sing a few words, a few lines to remember from the song. Really? Thank you. I wish you told me how to come with my guitar down, but however, <laughs> let me do my best, my horse voice now. Vosundeli kambo ya palanga, emi pareli kambo ya basi, alinga boti ya baso ye. So, kipana mi bari la ringari loko la bakufa, elenge ya mwasi ya kukire kukambo na mbari, goso kia poki ya paki na mbari. We never knew a minister, so it's also a musician. Ukarisi vino moko buyepi, palamu balinga moke bao. You really like this song. Well, it was the, Do you know the meaning of those words? Well, we try a little thing. Somebody singing to his love, love, and all that. Ah, yeah, interesting. <laughs> okay. uh, during our days, the in thing then, music wise. Well, we sang the song, we've enjoyed it. What were your hobbies growing up? What did you enjoy? Well, as I am, football was popular among young people. It was the best form of diversion, for diversion from the chores of daily life. I also played table tennis. Mm. Because during those times, there were social welfare offices all over the district I go to town. And Kotloko was no exception. So we had an area we'd go to, we'd uh, be encouraged to play games. But my hobby then was playing table tennis. And that's where I met my wife, playing table tennis. Wow. Yeah, so uh, this, this is a. Uh, then, of course, reading. We love reading African writers' sips, uh, novels, and uh, anything written in English we would learn. And for me, because I had an interest in wanting to speak French when I grew up, I would always make an opportunity to speak to any Francophone person that I come across. Wow. And that's how I was able to develop my French. Believe it or not, I learned my French only in secondary school until form si five. C'est pourquoi tu parles français très bien. Oui, parce que j'avais un grand intérêt ah. de parler la langue française. Et j'avais des bons euh, professeurs comme Madame euh, Alice Kamara, comme je vous ai dit, Madame Karimou, euh, l'ancien Miss Neal. Your, your Ça, c'est très bien. Your, your, <laughs> your, uh, but the elder sister. Moi aussi, je parle français, mais c'est pas très bien. Ah, non, so, non, for non. that, we're going back to English. Uh, you, will have to, you will have to convince me you don't speak French, because the accent with you. Yes, that's right. You know, it's very impressionant. Merci. Merci. Um, doctor, when you were growing up, of course, um, there are challenges in life. Mm -hmm. What are some of the challenges you had to face as a young man growing up wanting to be successful? Hmm. First of all, then we were taught that if you wanted to succeed, you must do well in school. In fact, indeed, at the time, we would see that everybody you see that was successful in terms 
of making the best for them in life, of going to school, of the education. So we're all focused on becoming doctors, we're all focused on becoming engineers, all that. So your aim was to do well in school. Scholarships were few and far between. It was only for those who would pass and pass well would do that. So your aim was always to go to secondary school. And for us, and I can't say for Toko, it was Schlenker. Because for us, Schlenker was synonymous with secondary school. And then the, uh, the ultimate is to go to private college. So we all aimed at that. And because the competition was high, you really had to study. So it's actually trying to make the grades. Was the, was the challenge. The challenge. So how did you overcome those challenges? You become competitive. You make friends with people you believe they are doing well in their various subjects. You discuss with them. You study hard. Go to the library. And uh, sometimes uh, you can't believe this. When I was at St. Francis and taking uh, uh, O level, we would beg the librarian to lock us in the library. We spend the night there and then come back out in the morning. There's nothing that. It's success itself. It says 90% hard work, only 10% luck. So you, with hard work, you're bound to make uh, life. So really, which uh, university did you study? I went to the University of Nottingham in England. So at what what point in your life did you leave Sierra Leone to go to England? I left in October 1973, having finished my sixth form at uh, Sierra Leone Grammar School. It was a very good sixth form then in the sciences. And I decided that I wanted to be a nuclear physicist at the time. <laughs> but my teacher one day, one Mr. Gunnell, caught me up by the post office and said to me, Alfred Gunnell, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a nuclear physicist. I said, and then what? When you become a nuclear physicist, where will you work in Sierra Leone? Who will employ you to try something more practical? So then at the time I decided I wanted to go into mining engineering. And then in 1973, I had a scholarship. Was in Nottingham and where I studied. So you studied mining engineering. Mining engineering. How did you become a politician then? Accidentally. The transitions. It's accidental. accidental. Ah, we want to get the story. All right. Well, I was an engineer for a very long time. I also taught at the Fulbright College as a lecturer in the Department of Geology. And I also became a consultant in mining engineering. And then in business, I veered away into other things like setting up airlines. And I like to do the impossible things. Mm, okay. the apparently impossible. Keep it up, you might only get to Guinness Book of World Record. <laughs> <laughs> the first private airline in Sierra Leone, which in fact uh, linked the sub region from Lagos to Accra, Dakar, up to Dakar, to Freetown, and that until uh, the war came and then we had to close. And when we came back after the war, uh, there was need for the ordering of the political climate. And I found out that um, uh, the only way that we could make a difference uh, in the systems was that um, you know, people who have been to uh, who have professional backgrounds should also go into politics. Because before, people who were really heavy intellectuals would turn their noses out against in politics, they would always want to stay or leave that politics for those people. But when uh, President Kuruma now, then Ernest Kuruma decided that he would throw the hat in the ring, I had enough confidence in him for me to stick my future in politics. I said, if you're going, I will go with you. And that's how I came into politics without any experience. Well, then, well, it's, it's and then school. you became a member of parliament. I became a member of parliament in 2002. And the, elections that followed uh, immediately after the dissolution of parliament and this was uh, that was in 2002, 2002. when um, our president now dr anis baikuma lost the election to president kabala yes well, we went there for the learning purposes we knew we were not going to win but we had to try we got in there and uh, took the apc from five seats in parliament to 27 in one go and that i think was a success in itself don't forget that the APC had been overthrown out of uh, uh, governance by the NPRC. So, so far it was a banned party. Your political career government. is doing well because you've, you've changed several ministries and now presently you are the Minister of Information and Communication. But you've been a successful man, I'll say. Congratulations. What would you give credit to, say, is responsible for your successes in life? Well, the, first of all, the, when you grow up from the areas that we grew up in, among many people, you would 
not want your children to have to go through the same challenges, you know, and so first thing you determine is you say, look, I want to be successful. I want to have a good home. I want to have the ability to send my children to school and to give them what they want at any time. So then you have to put in the graft, work very hard, and then got in there and then work very hard and then succeed to go to university. And once you get into university, in our days, that is already a ticket to success. Because when we finish school, we, and, and this government here would actually send you a ticket. And they would send somebody to pack your things, and then they would send you money to buy a car in order to come home so that you can join the uh, national development. Not only that, now, this, the population has grown, and then there are so many graduates that we don't have enough jobs to go around. But it used to be a very good country. And they encourage you to, you know, when you go into the sixth form at a time, you are paid for going to school. For me, government used to pay me a monthly salary for me to go to school. And that is the kind of sterling. So the government itself encouraged you to go because the resources were enough. At the moment, there are more people and less resources. So it's not enough to go around. So we try to distribute So that. am I correct to summarize and say, because of your upbringing, the things you lacked and wanting to provide for your children is one of the things that pushed you to become successful? Well, there's always a room for improvement. You want to improve upon what you do. Our people say, Como and Como Como Tasma. That is, born you begin, make it pass you. So they always tell you that. I have got to this level, build upon it, and grow. So that is what we were motivated with, right from the home. And then that is instilled in you that there's no room for failure. You must try so that you can uplift yourself and uplift the family and show that somebody did sacrifice their yesterday for your own tomorrow. So that is the kind of satisfaction. And also to please your parents. You want them to feel proud that you're doing well. And when you do that, you end up. The reward always is a good job. So far, how would you assess your parenthood? Are, are your children, have your children come out the way you were expecting? Yes, I'm trying. We've been to university, so graduates, and all that, they're doing well. And they're still, some because they're not married yet, they're living with me. And um, I'm quite happy with them, the way they're striving. Yes, I feel that uh, my wife and myself, she is a medical doctor, like uh, Agnes Kanye herself. She's been a very good mother, and I believe I have been a very good father also. But well, let me tell you what the inspiration was. Actually, uh, in Port Loco, there was a couple. One was an engineer, the other one was a doctor, Taylor Lewis. I have engineer Taylor Lewis and Dr. Taylor Lewis. Uh, very similar to yourself and your then, wife. Then, uh, then, so we always uh, admire them, doctor and uh, engineer husband, the engineer and his engineer, his doctor wife. So I decided one day, look, I will try and be an engineer, my wife a doctor. By coincidence, it happens. I'm an engineer, my wife a doctor. And do you know what happened? Mm -mm. That same doctor, the same doctor and engineer, uh, their son came to our house here, my uncle's the house to marry my cousin, my sister, uh, ah. and I gave told them the story. So you were an inspiration. Wow. Admired you, you were an engineer, she was a doctor. Because we had you as role models. Today I'm an engineer, my wife is a doctor. How so long have you been with your wife? Hmm. Since the time you met upon your marriage and now? How long? Uh, 1963. So now it's 52 years. Wow. I met her, as I told you, I was playing table tennis. <laughs> I was 11 years old then. And then I liked her. I never proposed. Maybe now is the time to go and propose to her. We just assume, <laughs> from that point on, we just assume that she was going to be my wife and I was going to be her husband. And that's how it went. But of course, Diane, I've been implicated. Mm. You stand a long way and just point, I'll be a girlfriend that one day. You wouldn't even go near. When you see her, you run away. This was a wonderful woman. And, uh, has been all these years. We've been married for years What do you think you now. enjoyed back then as a young man growing up from the society, the community, that young people are not enjoying now that would you know, probably want to distract them from focusing on the right things in life? Well, first of all, we're very disciplined and very happy to be home all the time. Freetown was very attractive to come to. But believe me, Port was more attractive. When we came to Freetown, we would do everything we would do to run back to Port for the night. Because at the end of the day, us boys, 
would go and congregate around the town square. We call it Wolf Road, that is the center of a block of time. And we sit down, we tell our stories for the day. So you don't want to miss that. And those stories inspire each other. Those who have had successes, those who have had problems. You know. So we always go back. There's a time I remember with my cousin, uh, Alpha Dumbuya. We came to Freetown and we had to go back to the block. No matter how late. We went and the vehicle we had was going to McKinney. We took it. The doctors at Ubiri Junction, it was late at night. There was no way to get a vehicle to go to Putloko. We walked the 11 miles just to go to Putloko and sit there with our friends. There are certain young people in the country who think the only way for them to succeed is if they travel out of Sierra Leone. What would you say to them? I tell them that's the wrong notion. That's the wrong aspiration. People who live overseas, people who born overseas. Mm -hmm. They also have the difficulties that you have here. I believe the environment is created for you where you are, for you to grow, for you to develop yourself. And the best way to do that now is to acquire skills, to acquire education. And taking it from that point, this yeah. is where we wrap up. There's one thing I want you to do for us. Mm -hmm. Now, assuming you are the father of all the young people paying attention to us right now watching this program, a heart-to-heart -heart message to them for them to be inspired and motivated to be successful in life. Say to them what you want to say. Well, this, I am happy because I have the opportunity to talk to you directly, young people in Sierra Leone. I was like you before, I was a young man. I was a child even. Sometimes walking along the streets of Potloko without shoes. Well, the intention was always there. The hope was always there. That one day I'll have my own pair of shoes. But we will not get those pair of shoes either by stealing it or going overseas. They had to be fought with hard work from uh, here in Sierra Leone. We had the good schools. We had the good schools. That, that, that when we went overseas after secondary school, you excel because the standard of education then in Sierra Leone is very high. It still is very high. I advise you to stay home. Finish what you have to do. Get some skills before you go outside. If you teach yourself uh, how to be independent, if you were to go out overseas, you will be immediately grabbed by an employer to give you a good job. But when you go overseas without a scholarship, without enough money to go to school, all that, what will you do? You'll have to turn over to menial jobs, sweeping the streets, cleaning the hotel rooms, washing plates, and all that. but that's all is good. Provided the money you get from that, you will use to further yourself, hoping that one day you will return home. You must remember that if you go overseas, it is to come home. Home is where you want to last. But Sierra Leone does provide all the opportunities for you to grow, for young people to learn the skills. What we are doing as a government, as we're saying now, is to provide the environment for you to find ways you can exercise and discover your own talent. So don't give up in living in Sierra Leone. Going overseas is not the rosiest thing because the streets are not paved with gold. Let me give you a story. My friend who is dead now, he's called George Cassell. He is the one who set up the cast cleaning services in England. One day, he sent for his brother, Ben. He said, Ben, come over. He said, I'm in England, in a street with a pickup. He said, come over. So when Ben came, he asked his brother, he said, where is this money? He said, come, let's go. He gave him a pail. He gave him a brush. He said, let's go. They went to the House of Commons. They cleaned all day. And go back. And at the end of the week, a fat check came. He saw it. He said, ah, brother George, all this money? He said, yes. He said, this is what I meant. That the money is in the street. If you apply, Hard work, you will find it anywhere you go. So even here in Sierra Leone, the money in the streets. Otherwise, why do strangers, foreigners, prosper in Sierra Leone? They run away. Take the case. Very simple case of Jaji, who's running the uh, Pelican. He came from Nigeria. We will run away from here. I said, better not be in a salon. So it's about bringing in the innovation. Bring the innovation. And that is why, as Minister of, Foreign, uh, Minister of Information and Communication, I am working very hard under the direction of President Kuruma to ensure that this whole country is wired up 
with the fiber optic cable so that we have our broadband. Once we have the broadband and the Wi-Fi, you can do anything. Thank you very much, Honorable Alhaji, Dr. Alpha Kano. The titles are so many, right? I have to slow down to call them. Thanks for telling us your story and inspiring us, the young generation. Thank you very much. And he has been our guest in today's edition of Leave Your Dreams. Pick out the inspiration from his story. See, 95% success comes with hard work, just 10% luck. So you have to be hardworking to get to where you want to get to. It doesn't come easy. No one is going to come down to feed you easily. It doesn't happen like that. Even God will not come down and feed you in the morning, afternoon, and evening. He will bless you, but you have to put in something. That's hard work and dedication. And that's what we're leaving you with. Live your dreams. Be inspired. Never give up in life. Work hard and leave the rest to your destiny. I am Phoebe Swill. Thank you for staying with us. Till next edition. Cheers.